Time is another time. If you can, don't step on that lifesaver. You got it. Okay. Boy, I rolled that far, huh? to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. And others say Elijah. And still others say one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you're the Messiah. And Jesus sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Here ends the reading of the word. May God bless to our understanding this reading. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we come before you on this day which you have set aside and called us together. We ask your blessing as we have sung your praises and read from your holy word. Now, O oh God, be with us, help us, guide us, and protect us, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I know uh, putting the title up comes as a great surprise to you, after all that. You know, the fun part is when Kathy does the children's moment, God forces it to work together. Because Kathy and I don't talk. It just happens. When I do the children's moment, it comes off a little contrived. Sorry, that's just the way it has to go. Because I know where things are going next. So... Oh, good. I didn't know how I was going to do a side to you when you were way up there. Thanks. I appreciate that. But the wrong already down. And the wireless mic on. I thought, oh, good. I can come down. Come to the people. So, Brian, are you expressing you think it's a little on the loud? So, I'm trying to get Mike to fear that you're cutting out. Thank you, Yeah. Am I cutting out? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You're good. I'll just I'll just shout if I'm aware. How's that? Norma, you tell me if you can't hear me, okay? You just raise your hand and I'll yell a little loud. 
I said Orma, not you. <laughs> okay, watch that just went down. I'm not in trouble. Now I can focus. Jesus is in arguably the dead center of the gospel according to Mark here. As we encounter Christ going into this region of Caesarea Philippi, things are starting to shift. And we know it's a shift point because, well, we can count, right? If you look at the number of chapters in Mark and know you're in the 8th chapter, it's not rocket science. But the bigger issue is Jesus, in this text, starts talking about death. <coughs> now, as you know, it's become my goal in life to turn you all into little Bible scholars. And we do that one week at a time. And this week, what I want to focus on in terms of being little Bible scholars is if you read the three synoptic Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they're the ones that tell the story with more or less of a timeline. John comes at it from a completely different angle. He is trying to respond to the Gnostics and the idea that if you just know enough, you will achieve salvation. But the other three are more historic timeline type gospels. Now, they still tell their stories with a little bit of target audience, I guess would be a good way to say that, right? And just as a reminder for those of you who have already done your biblical scholarship homework for the day, uh, Matthew was really, really aggressively writing to the Jews to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. So a lot of his structure is centered around the idea of proving that Jesus really is the Messiah. Meanwhile, Luke is writing to the whole world with the notion that Jesus had a mission of going from Jerusalem and Judea throughout the nation to all the world, right? You see Luke telling stories that radically include the Gentiles and the rest of the world, and, and, and he's very expansionist. You'll see that in Acts as well. Same theme, from Jerusalem and Judea to throughout the country to the ends of the earth. And then you have Mark. No scholar has ever boldly tried to declare Mark's target audience. What we know about Mark is it was the first gospel written, and it is clear he was in a hurry. And every transition is clear. As you go through Mark, you will find a lot of immediately. But the other thing you find in Mark that is fascinating, we've already started talking about this a little in the last couple of weeks, is Mark is really big on what scholars like to call Markan secrecy. Right? So Markan, like Martian, Mark, and the theme of secrecy. The notion that the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, the one sent from God, in Mark, throughout the book, is a secret. And Jesus is constantly saying, don't tell. Don't tell. Even in this text, who do you say that I am? Peter answers, you're the Messiah. Verse 30, and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Don't tell. That always works. Right? Don't tell Bill I said this. That's right. Ron just said two can keep a secret if one of them are dead. That wasn't in the sermon originally, but it is now. Good job. But that's not what I want to focus on so much as to make sure you've got that biblical perspective as we move forward. Because the other thing that's going on is this teaching Jesus follows up with. This is, for many people, a really troubling teaching. Those who would save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake will save it. You know, I was going to use this in children's moment, I decided against it, I'm coming back to using it, I just need to use it with the bigger kids. So, these are fat heads. Actually, this appears to be a fat head knockoff. Interesting. Pander to your audience, right? 
Okay, wait a minute. Let, let me show off my true loyalties. Um, well, why do people buy these? Because they're crazy. Actually, they were gifts. I didn't buy them. People buy these things because they're fans. People buy these things because they like to be associated with the team or the idea or the notion. It's the same reason, sorry, I knew I would get some today, why they wear jerseys. You know, it's, it's, it's a sense <laughs> of allegiance and affiliation. But the thing is, it's one thing, and I know I'm guilty of this, um, and the reason I brought this one. I was <coughs> hardcore TCU loyal when they didn't win a game. I was hardcore loyal when we stood around in the quad saying, cheer, literally, this was the cheer. We were getting ready to play the University of Texas. The cheer, or was it Arkansas? It was Arkansas, sorry. And the, and the cheer, oh gosh, Arkansas today, go figure. Did Brett Bielema step in it or what? Um, boy, a lot of hardcore football fans. They all got that one right away. Um, and the cheer was, 22's enough. Which meant 22 times TCU had lost to Arkansas. And the cheer, the rallying cry was, that's enough. <laughs> and, I mean, and, and I think I wanted to bring that up because the difference between being a fan and being a loyalist is kind of a big deal. It's one thing to love your team when they're great. It's another when it's not so much. Right? When the team's in trouble, when things are not going well, when the seasons aren't winning, when people aren't trying, when people go, you're a what fan? That's hard. And I think to an extent, that's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, remember, in the middle of the gospel, is getting really popular. Right? He's kind of the hot team of the year. People are showing up because they're buzz. People are joining on. People are bandwagoning. People are, 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 are checking this thing out. And I believe this text is speaking to us to say, this Christianity thing, this faith thing, this following me thing, is not always sunshine, roses, and victories. You've got to be ready for some hard, down times. Right? In 1989, I've told part of this story before. That was when I started first really experiencing my call to ministry. I think I've told you the story before about the guy in the waiting room that said, I think God's working on you. Have I told you this story? I think I have. Let me remind you for those that were absent that day. So, I was raised in the church. Good disciples boy. Dedicated as an infant. Baptized at age 12 on Easter Sunday. Uh, always involved in the youth group literally got part-time jobs where I refused to work on Sundays for religious grounds. I was that kid. I was a youth leader in the region. I went to TCU uh, partially on scholarships for being a regional youth leader. I, um, but never felt called to ministry and did what many adults do, not all of us. And um, as soon as I got to college, I spent the first probably four, six, maybe 12 weeks as a pretty faithful church attender. Placed a student membership in a congregation and then discovered Sunday morning was awfully hard to get out of for. <laughs> Which turned into a nine-year hiatus. And then, as my life hit hard points, I decided one of the things I needed to do was get right with God, get back in God's good graces. So I started going to church. And you know what happened? Life got worse. 
So I was in the pastor's office because I was wanting to say, what's the deal? And that's when this stranger from down the road said to me, you've got a little too much pride. And God is trying to grind. Can you imagine I had more? And God is trying to grind some of that out of you. There are things coming in your life and ministry you cannot imagine. I came to church trying to save my life. It was not until I was willing to say, let me give it up for the sake of the gospel that God really started to work. Once I gave in to that thought, amazing things happened. Would you believe? You better believe because it's true. Within two months was the day I met Sarah after I finally gave in. Would you believe that once I gave in, within three months, my employment situation was back stabilized and I could actually pay my bills? Would you believe that within four months, how do I say this? Because I can leave it and walk away from it any time. I don't have the challenge that alcoholics have, that I was sober. And, and I want to be respectful of those who struggle differently than me. Would you believe that within six months, multiple churches were asking me, non-trained, to work with their youth, and suddenly I had choices. You see, I was trying to save my life while God was saying, give up and let me take this one. Life will be hard. Life is not all lifesavers. But sometimes when you're giving yourself over to purpose, when you become asserts, same basic ingredients, God uses you for something. God takes that willingness. God changes other lives. I am convinced that Judgment Day is nothing like we expect it to be. By the way, remember, we're working on a loose, a loosely framed sermon series this fall called The Church Speaks to Society because people are out there complaining on Facebook that society is guiding the church. So here's my speech to society today. God expects you to fulfill a purpose. God does not make that purpose easy because earning it is worthwhile. And I believe that judgment day, the judgment is not, this is the other play on words I was going for, for the certain they are right with God, for those that can point to their sinless life, for those that can point to their pious perfection as they interpret the scriptures, Judgment Day, the winners at Judgment Day are the ones that can answer this question. Wow, I'm glad you're here. Who'd you bring with you? Let that one soak in a minute. Do I need to interpret it? Wow. I'm thrilled you're here. Who did you bring with you? Who meant the gospel because of you? Who encountered Christ because of you? Who knew love for the first time because of you? Who knew acceptance without regard to what the rest of the stupid Christians ruining Christianity would say? Because of you. Who knew suddenly they were a child of God with a purpose? Because of you. I believe that's the real test question. On judgment day. You were created with a God-sized purpose to love 